you for inviting me over to your house. No, you're very welcome. I really appreciate it. And uh, the last time I was here, we had dinner. You cooked some amazing spaghetti. I did. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm famous for that. That's yes, Sunday dinners. That but I don't. I. I don't remember what kind of pasta. You'll forgive me because I well, have many different kinds. Well, it was spaghetti. Know. Spaghetti. The big meatballs. Oh, spaghetti meatballs. Yeah. Right. Well, that's something for the kids, you know. Well, I, I loved it, and and as we were we were talking, I, I'm I, I observe a lot, and I noticed you were, you were you told stories very well. You had all of us glued in. Oh, thanks. So you. when did you know that you had a passion for storytelling? What a great question. I never thought of it as storytelling. I, maybe it's part of the culture. I don't know. I mean. When I grew up, uh, the dinner conversation was always filled with stories, you know. You had to tell a story with the beginning, middle, and end, and I suppose you always wanted to entertain. You always wanted a good punchline. Did I, I don't know if I'm particularly good at it. I mean, it's just something that's part of my tradition, you know, the family's tradition, I guess you could say. So, was your father or mother into filmmaking, or...? No, they both thought it was a ridiculous enterprise. Uh, in fact, my father, who... Uh, I thought at the time was just completely out of his mind, told me, he said, you should major in computers and computer graphics. And I said, ah, I don't want to do that, it's boring. And he said, there's a company called Microsoft, you should work for them. Now, if I'd followed my father's advice, maybe I'd be, you know, worth a few billion dollars. But um, <laughs> I'm, I'm thankful I chose the path I did. My mother knew nothing about movies, nothing. So when you had this, um, this passion for filmmaking, what were the, the steps that you took? to start out? Well, it's a great question. Now, the first thing I did, I mean, I never, I didn't think it was something you could get a job at, you know. I thought that it was something that was just a huge load of fun. And uh, what I would do is I would go to movies constantly. I went to three, four, five movies uh, during the week and three or four movies during the weekend. I saw maybe 10 or 12 movies a week. And then I had a teacher, as usually what happens is you have one person mm -hmm. in your life who sort of saves you. And in this case, it was uh, my teacher who taught Latin, believe it or not. And he said, well, what do you like? I said, well, I like Patrick Ewing, who has uh, just become the center of the Knicks. And he's, I said, I like Don Mattingly, who was the first baseman of the Yankees. And I said, I like movies. He said, well, I can't do anything about Patrick Ewing or Don Mattingly, but movies, maybe that's something. And he created the film club for us at school. And I started to think, somebody has to make these movies. So by the time I was 18, I was doing my own little short films. I'm sure all of them are terrible. I mean, I was it the them. Cowboys and Angels? Well, no, that was my college Co short okay, film. Okay, college short uh, film. That was when I was 21. Cool. I made that. But when I was 18, finally having to, uh, getting the chance to apply to colleges, I was very lucky. I got some scholarship money from the University of Southern California and made my way from New York to L.A., and before I knew it, I was making short films, and it really felt like a dream. But I'm sure there had to be some challenges. It's not, you made it sound so swift, so easy. So, not, not necessarily easy, but well, what, what kind of challenge? Cha of course there were challenges, Preston. I mean, the whole yeah. idea was that my parents said, you know, and I understand why they said it. I wasn't mad at them for saying it. And I'm not mad at them in retrospect. They said, you'll never make it. There's no wow. way you they can do it. They told you that? Oh, yeah. Wow. But I wasn't mad, and I'm not mad now. You're not mad, okay. Because the odds are very much, uh, you know, they're very difficult. But it doesn't mean it's impossible. And also, what I did notice was that the people who had the true passion for it actually did wind up doing what they wanted to do. There were others who said, yeah, filmmaking seems cool, and they were the ones who didn't make it. So, I guess in a way, my parents, without even knowing it, forced a question about how passionate I was. Yeah. And when they basically told me that, you'll never make it. Wow. Yes, I will. Yes, I'll you show will. You. That's right. As opposed to, oh, yeah, you're right. Because maybe yeah. if I'd said, oh, you're right, I wouldn't have made it. it would, I wouldn't have had the drive. So it was surprisingly easy for me. I was very lucky. Well, you, that, that, that took a lot of resilience for you to... Cause, Some. Cause but passion really wins the day, Press. I mean, mm. look, I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. I, to me, it was like... You know, it was the closest thing to a dream that there is in the world. And you go to the movies, and I always say when the light comes down, and you sit there in the theater and the lights dim, it could be the best thing you ever saw in your life. Now, almost always it isn't, right? Almost always we see the movie, it's a disappointment and all that. But that moment is filled with unlimited potential. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't find that anywhere else in my life. Mm. It's beautiful. So when you're in school, you, you, you first start with a short film. That's right. And I hear that it was so well. So there was an agent that discuss, he, he noticed the, the short film that you did first? Or? Well, what happened was I made a short film in college, which was about 12 minutes long. And that showed at the Student Academy Awards screenings. And people responded to it very well. And I got an agent out of college. And by the time I was 23, I was making my first feature. Wow. Now, that's... That's pretty that's much a, that's it. amazing. That's luck. Now, that's I, now, now hold on, hold up now. See, I don't, I don't believe in luck because you were putting in work, right? You were, you well, were working, I was. you were working hard. And no, I was. Yeah. I wasn't, you know, phoning <laughs> it in. <laughs> right, right, I mean, right. obviously, you yeah. have to do the work. You have to do the work. But I say it's luck because I was able to come in contact with people mm. whom I loved, who liked me, and they helped me. But and maybe that you, matters. maybe you were in the right place too. Did you position yourself? Did you try to? I guess I did. You know, be strategic a little well, bit. Well, I wasn't. I wasn't consciously tr strategic because that would mean that I knew what I was doing, <laughs> which I kind of didn't. But I think that what saved me, I, I, I'll tell you what it is. I was obsessed with the subject, and I did everything I could to educate myself about it. You know the expression, do the deep dive. It's like I did the deep dive on the movies. And I remember when I got to college, when I was 18. This was 19, uh, 1987. Um, I'm old. <laughs> you're not old. Um, thank you. And you're doing I great. liked you're, you're, anyway. And you're, you're, you're fit. You're, you're doing well. Oh, proud I'm of you. Proud of you. Um, when I got to college in 87, I was 18. And I have to say, this, even though this sounds arrogant, I knew more about movies than anybody else in my class. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that was because I had grown up in New York and I had access to all the movie theaters and some of them showed old movies too and I had watched all of them. But also I was more into it than other people in my class was. I, I knew I had to make it. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, I always, I always tell my children, you know, the passion for sub a subject is everything. Mm -hmm. People really respond to that. So passion. when I graduated and I met, you know, producers and agents, I think they sensed mm -hmm. if it was anything that isn't chalked up to luck, it would be that they sensed a desire and a love yeah. to do good work. Yeah. And I think that's what maybe they responded to. No, but I, I was I was still quite fortunate. The passion. Passion. I think passion wins everything. I mean, I try to tell my kids this, you know, like it doesn't even matter what you want to do. If you are driven in a way, and I don't mean driven like, you know, beat up your friend and <laughs> get what you want. <laughs> right, I mean driven meaning you love it. It's, in, it's a fire. It's a fire inside of you. You love it. You know, um, I also loved and still do love baseball. Um, I was no good at it. But, you know, there's a similar situation. A player named Pete Rose. He was not naturally good at baseball. And he loved it so much, and he was so addicted to it, that he became a great baseball player in the major leagues, nicknamed Charlie Hustle. He used to, when he got a walk, he would run to first base. People said, why are you running to first base? He'd say, because I gotta get to first base quicker. That means I can score quicker. Mm -hmm. There was a fire in him, and there were other people. One time, my wife and I went to dinner with a, 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 a guy who had played in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I was, of course I had to ask him, this was in the early mid-90s, I had to ask him about Michael Jordan, whom I both loved and admired, but also hated because he used to beat my team all the time. And he said, you know, Michael Jordan was, of course, incredibly talented, he said, but he was also unbelievably smart, and there were other players who were more talented mm -hmm. than he was, mm -hmm. but he was smarter and he worked harder, mm -hmm. and he was more competitive. He would kill you mm -hmm. to win the game. And so that, I think, matters more than we think. You know, I think, I think, in fact, if you look at sports, the perfect analogy, how smart Derek Jeter is, for example, or was, when I used to watch baseball, how smart he was on a baseball field. You can't beat it. Wow. Well, I, I recently watched your film, at Astra, uh -huh. and it, it, was, it, was, it was great. Because oh, when we were, when we were talking at the dinner table, you, you were so humble with it. Uh, but I sat there, I watched it, I was, you know, and, and, and I, I felt like I was in space. Like, oh, like so it was, it, was, it was great. And I was looking around at the people, too. I observed people. They were hanging off the edge, too. Oh, were they? And um, there, was, there was so many different scenes. You know, Brad with the tear. Yeah. That got me. But 
I, I wanted to say why was that why was that film so important for like why why was that story so so important for you to, to you know to to to, to the, you know to share yeah. with the world? It's a funny. It's a great question. It's a funny answer, really. Sometimes you don't know. Mm. Sometimes what happens is the, s the subject speaks to you, the emotion speaks to you, and it's almost like it's other people's job to tell me why I had to do it. Right. I just feel the need in a way that I don't even know how I could explain it. Mm -hmm. It's just something I felt I needed to express about a father and a son, and that I suppose the more intimate the story became, the more interesting it became to set it as far out as a human being could go, you know, the outer edge of the solar system. Because sometimes you understand things in contrast, right? Mm -hmm. You go so far out, it, yeah. it seems like you're in the middle of nowhere yeah. to tell the smallest story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt that that contrast was actually very helpful to the story. And so I was just driven to do something about a father and a son, really. Yeah, and I, I thought it was great how you did everything. And it just showed a lot with, with us just you know, we don't really s sometimes focus on the here and the now. Yeah, never. The, the present. It's sad, isn't it? It is sad. You know, there was a great Japanese artist named mm -hmm. Hakusai, and I'm going to misquote him because I'm not smart enough to quote him correctly, but I'll do my best. You know, he lived until he was maybe 85 years old. He was pretty old. And he he's famous for a, 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 th a thing he said where he said, I hope that by the time I'm 120 years old, that God will grant me the wisdom to see the beauty in a leaf. Ooh, that was that was great. So the mm -hmm. idea being that we can fill our heads with neurotic ideas or mm -hmm. problems or oh my God, you know my well, the heel of my shoe fell off while I was walking. <laughs> right. or my, I have a scratch on my car. Right, right. But in the end, you have to kind of remove all of that and find beauty in mm -hmm. the doing, find beauty in the now. Mm -hmm. You know. 20 years ago, I didn't have children. Um, I didn't care about a praying mantis. Mm -hmm. But my nine-year-old son at the time, he was nine, now he's 10, brought me out here to the garden. Mm. And he said, Daddy, look, 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 look. I said, what is it? What is it? I was in the middle of working. Right. He said, I need you to see this. And he showed me this beautiful praying mantis on a leaf. Mm. And all of a sudden, I understood that comment about finding beauty in a leaf. All of a sudden, you realize you have to appreciate now the moment. Yeah. This is what is. This is yeah. what matters. You know. Wow. Mm. No, no, it's it's, it's true. It, it it it's it's because the rest <sighs> is noise. The rest is noise. The rest is noise, right? Can canned mm. peaches are in sale this week. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and the world is a complicated place and mm. getting more complicated. Mm. Now, if I said to you, yeah, shampoo. Yeah. Right. 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you went to the supermarket and you said, I'd like some shampoo. Right. There were maybe two bottles of shampoo you could get. Right, right. Go to the, sh go to the shampoo t today at the supermarket. There's like 240 shampoo <laughs> brands. And you stand there and you go, uh, <laughs> what shampoo do I get? Uh, do I get conditioner? Uh, do I get the green bottle, the blue bottle, the big one, the small one? Right. That's a form of stress. Yeah, yeah. And we have to focus our lives on removing that that's noise that doesn't matter so does does being present help you get rid of stress well i try you know meditation i don't meditate some people say it's incredible mm -hmm. you know the beatles brought that to us to the west uh, yeah. in the late 60s I, I some people swear by it and i i can believe in it completely i'm just too i'm just too still too uh, to, to meditate yeah but I really do think that but, it's no, great. But, oh, sorry to cut no, you off. I, I do think the, the praying mantis, that's a form of meditation. How well, you, it is. How you paused. Absolutely. But I'm going to yeah. tell you something else. When I, when I f first, Allie and I first had children. Your you wife. Know, yeah. My wife. First night, first had children. Thank you. You know, they'd be up all night or whatever. And I found it very precious to sit and listen to music at the end of the evening after they were in bed to sleep. But I don't do that anymore. Now I sit in the dark and mm. in quiet. I don't listen to music, I want silence. Mm. And that sounds ridiculous, but I think it's a form of meditation that at the end of the day, I sit generally in here actually, okay. just in the dark, and I just sit 
for a few minutes. I just try to decompress from the day, try to relax. Mm -hmm. uh, I have found it very helpful because especially here in LA, right? You spend all your day, <laughs> get out of the way. You know, you have to get milk and it's the most stressful thing oh. ever. You know, the, the guy made a left turn and he went into the right hand lane. It was ridiculous. You know, this kind of thing. Yes. Calm down. Calm down. This is all that matters. The here, the now. Well, s speaking of calmness, I, I, wanna, I want your take on this. Uh, about life in a way mm. if you would describe this what do you think our our purpose it's a big question but what do you think our purpose is on earth well I mean if I knew the answer <laughs> to that I'd be like the greatest mind of the 20th yeah, century or 21st century we have our thoughts uh, you know I know what I think I think I know what my purpose is so maybe that matters which is all ideas about fame. Mm -hmm. He's famous. She's famous. Right. Nobody's famous. Mm. If I said to you, one of the biggest movie stars in the world mm -hmm. in the 1930s in Warner, for the Warner Brothers studio, right. George Brent, do you know who that is? Mm -mm. He was huge. So wow. my point is, everybody is forgotten. Mm. Everybody. Mm. Knowing that... The, um, the ambition then can't be the purpose of your life is to get rich and famous. That's not going to last. Right, right. What does last is, did you contribute at all so that you added to this thing, this mountain of thing, what we call progress, right. and so that maybe two, 200 years after you're dead, someone can find something or read something that you said or maybe meet somebody that you had an impact on 17 generations ago. All it means is you leave life a little bit better than when you found it. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what matters over time. I agree. I, I, I really believe that. I, I've, I've, I've come to feel that way more and more, and now it's kind of taken over my thoughts completely. What can I do that's positive? Well, I that think you're doing contribute? that now, well, too. Well, I'm trying. <laughs> I don't know about that, but, you know. Even... I, you're not going to agree with this, but I do think you are wise. I do think what you're sharing is... I don't is agree with <laughs> Wise. I do think what you're sharing... Where's my wife? Hey, you said I'm wise. <laughs> but you've you come across a lot of interesting people. You've met a lot of interesting people. What's the best advice you've ever received? It's a very, very funny story, and it's, it's going to sound stupid, but you'll need me to explain it just okay. for a second. When I was 16, I got a job at a studio in New York called Astoria Studios. And I, had, I went to this big black tie gala thing and I was handing out uh, presents after the end of the party, you know, swag, to this big gala event. And I saw the director, Sidney Pollack, who was at the time a very well-known, established, famous director, wonderful director. Uh, he's dead now, unfortunately. I got to know him a bit the, uh, toward the end, but he was a lovely guy. Anyway, he was standing there, just having a drink by himself. So I went up to him, and I said, do you have any advice? And he went like this. He looked at me, and he must have thought, who is this idiot? Took a sip of his drink, and he went, you just got to do. And I left, and I thought, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. You just got to do. What does that mean? He was completely right. Mm. Cut out the noise do it do it focus on the work nothing else matters F Fred comes over to you and says I saw what you did it stinks don't worry about that Fred comes over to you and says I love what you did don't worry about it focus on the work that's all that matters over time do the best work you can try to build this mountain of, toward this mountain of progress speak with your own voice you just got to do it and in the end, there are all kinds of excuses. Right. Doing is what matters. Doing so I would say that is the best advice I ever got, weirdly. Well, you just got to do. Well, James, I really appreciate it. Not at all. This is awesome. Thanks, Preston. Appreciate